Hey, I'm Sunny. And I'm Sandy, coming to you from sunny San Diego, California. And we're the host of a weekly audio show at podcacher.com. A show all about geocaching. Come stop by and take a listen. We think you like what you hear. Now you're about to see a high-quality video zine produced by Isenride. So sit back, relax, stay safe, and keep keep on caching. Parks Canada Update. Micro Mural Madness. And shoutouts, shoutouts, shoutouts. All this plus science on this episode of Ice and Rise Geocaching Video Zine. Howdy y'all! Welcome to Ice and Rye Geocaching Video Zine. I'm Ice and Rye. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the show, welcome to the family. Essentially what this is, is me, a video camera, go geocaching, film it, throw it together with a few hints, tips and tricks, put it all together, throw it up on the web so you can download and watch at your own leisure. If you're a regular viewer, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate your viewership. So, what's been going on lately? Well, as I explained in the last microzine, summer's been a very, very busy time for me. And the big thing's been agility trials. Abel and I have been competing quite a bit, and he's been extremely successful. And we're moving up in our competition class. As a matter of fact, at our last uh, trial, we actually got the honor of competing against a U.S. champion, and uh, he did quite well. So, what else has been happening? Well, I went on vacation back in July, and I went to visit some friends in Calgary. And, well, if you're wondering what this thing is on my hat, on my head, it's, it's a cowboy hat. It seems that uh, during the Calgary Stampede, it's almost illegal to be seen in public without one of these on your head. So to uh, avoid risk of being jailed, shot, or labeled as someone from, like, Edmonton, I invested the money and purchased one of these hats. And it's kind of funky looking. It's definitely different. And the nice thing is it's got this big feather here where I'm sure I can hide a GPS antenna to hook up to my GPS receiver and it'll be great for urban camouflage while I'm doing those hard to find urban, urban camo caches. Now, one of the great things that happened while I was in Calgary is I got a chance to speak with a geologist from Parks Canada. And as I explained before, geocaching and Parks Canada have been working together to come up with a policy on the sport. And it was really interesting to speak with someone, as they say, from the other side and get their point of view on the sport of geocaching. Now, later on in this episode, I'll have an article on Parks Canada and geocaching, and it's really looking good for us. Looks like they're going to go through with it and allow it. They'll just be putting in some stipulations. But overall, nothing too crazy. But I'll get to that a little in the, uh, a little later in, in the episode. Now, as for his personal point of view of the sport, he loved it. He uh, does a lot of work in Jasper, so a lot of the caches that uh, he's found, I've found myself when we were able to go over them and chuckle and... Some of them he sort of shook his head, couldn't quite figure them out, and some of them he actually quite enjoyed it. So he's, he's all happy, he's ready for the sport to get going. He himself actually wants to see more caches in the park. The Parks Canada's finally realized that, hey, let's open up the sport and we'll get more people into the parks, but we are going to regulate it, and most of the rules they've come up with are actually considered to be quite fair. Uh, another personal news, travel bug update. You might remember I mentioned one of my Born to be Mild series was in a cache near Ramona, California. And my good friends, uh, Sandy and Sonny, from the Podcaster podcast, actually went out one day and tracked it down and have since moved it on. And if you don't know what the Podcaster podcast is, make sure you check out their website, podcaster.com. It's basically an audio podcast on a great sport of geocaching. But anyways, that's enough personal stuff for now. Let's get on with some geocaching news. All right. 
Hey, in geocaching news, let's start off with some milestone finds. From the BCGA website, Wiggly Beans make 1,000 caches. Congratulations to the Wild Wiggly Beans on their milestone accomplishment of reaching 1,000 cache finds. The beans reached the mark in only a year and a half of caching and chose Skookum Cache on the beautiful Sunshine Coast to mark the milestone. In addition to finding 1,000 caches, the beans are well known for hiding some of the best series of caches in BC. And as a matter of fact, we sort of have a little tradition here in BC that when a person reaches 1,000 finds, they celebrate with a special toast and they just happen to load some video here on the website and we're just going to let her roll, sit back and enjoy. Oh my goodness! Cool! <laughs> Also, from the BCGA website, congratulations to Doc Magoo for reaching number 600 at Rockfern number 2, August 5th on a perfect caching day at a fine cache. There's no stopping him, nope, no way, and all while contributing some fine caches for us to find. Big round of applause to Doc Magoo. Hey Doc, way to go, 600. I'm on your tail buddy though, I'm about 350 thereabouts, catching up, a couple more weekends down in the lower mainland, and I'll be there. Now we switch over to the Lower Mainlanders Geocaching Association website. And they write, Landsharks launch new website. The Landsharks team, Helen and Chris, have launched a new website. For those that do not know, they produce custom geocoins, sell geocaching gear and swag, and promote geocaching in Victoria, BC. I've dealt with the Landsharks myself. They make the official BC geocaching coin and they also make a special coin for the Lower Mainlanders Geocaching Association. And they have some really great stuff on their site. Again, I'll have links to my website. As a matter of fact, there'll be a link right about here in the graphics. And if you're in Canada and you're looking for some coins or swag or anywhere else in the world, as a matter of fact, make sure you check them out. From KSL.com Geocaching continues to grow in popularity. It's summertime and a lot of people are hitting the hiking trails. If you're looking to add another element to your hike, you might try geocaching. It's a sport or hobby that's really caught on. And this is a website of a television station and they actually have a article, a video article, that's in real format. So go to ksl.com, I'll actually have the link on the website and again right about here. And uh, check out the article. It's very entertaining and very informative. And our final news article is actually from the Washington Post, one of the most important newspapers in the world. And a few weeks ago they actually had an article on geocaching. And it was just a simple tutorial explaining what the sport is all about and how to get involved and it has all the links to geocaching.com and a few other helpful sites but the fact remains it was an article in the Washington Post that is big time media so guys down at ground speak hey thumbs up to you once you start getting to the major press in a good way that means our sports growing by leaps and bounds but anyways that's enough for news let's get on with viewers mail Viewers mail. First we hear from Click Chick and she writes, My husband decides that I killed my iPod, so he goes out and gets me a new one. Oh goody, more stuff I can download. So I started looking for dog training and agility photos. I happened upon your podcast and watched all the dog ones, then started watching the geocache ones hoping for more stuff about agility. Well it didn't take long to hook this geologist. Then I started listening to the podcaster podcast as well. Next thing I know, I had a brand new Explorer 600 in my hand and roaming the local parks for Rubbermaid containers. I will also be locating the local benchmarks as my area has a good number of them. Thanks, Ice and Rye, I think. Click Chick, from the swamps of Northeast Illinois. Well, Click Chick, welcome to the sport. A geologist and geocaching, you are going to have some serious fun. I guarantee it. And hey, thanks for watching my show and thanks for writing. So next we hear from Sean Tucker. This past weekend was Da Vinci Days in Corvallis, Oregon. We held our second annual Geocaching at Da Vinci competition. Nearly 100 people took part, both novice and advanced geocachers, hunting for hidden caches in downtown Corvallis. Some video and images are available on my website. Well, thanks for writing, Sean. I appreciate the photos. He has some great stuff there. And the videos were a lot of fun to watch also. So again, I'll have a link right about here. And also on my website, check them out. There's some great stuff. 
And if you have a future upcoming geocaching event you'd like me to mention on the show, email me, geoicenri at icenri.com. I'll make sure I mention it in a future episode. So next we hear from Jank Spirit, and he writes, Hi, Eisenreich. Props to you on the vodcast. I produced a video podcast about mountain biking. I have modeled my show's format after yours in many ways. I am also a regular geocacher and enjoy your content. I was riding my local trails last weekend here at Rock Cut State Park in Rockford, Illinois, and came across a family who was geocaching. He had just received a new GPS for Father's Day. I had my video iPod with me, so I tuned him in to your show. Keep up the good work. Jank Spirit. Well, again, thanks for the letter. And, hey, you got a pretty good-looking show yourself. I've checked out a couple episodes. And uh, I'm an old mountain biker myself. And, uh, fortunately, I haven't been on it in a few years, and it's starting to show. That wraps it up for viewers' mail. Let's get on with Frapper Map Shoutout. <laughs> Time for Frapper Map shoutouts. If you don't want Frapper Maps are, it's essentially your good old fashioned wall map where you stick in pens of very places you've been. And in our case, it's a wall map of where people live who watch my show. And if you're interested in joining, go to my website, www.icenri.com. Just look for the Frapper Map logo on the right side of the mini bar, click on it, add yourself to the map. If you'd like to get mentioned in the shoutouts when you add yourself to the map, upload a picture. The bigger the better, and I'll mention you in an upcoming shout-out. Anyways, I've had a ton of new pictures since my last episode, so I have more than the usual five this month. So let's not waste any more time, let's get into them. So this month, Frapper Map shout-outs go to Tricky MD, Captain Buttermilk, Survivor, Shooty, Timanushka, LRC91. Team Muppet, and special shout out for 600th find, the Doc Magoo. So guys, thanks for adding yourself to my Frapper map, and again, if you'd like to add, join yourself, visit my website, icenride.com, and just look for the Frapper map logo. So thanks everyone for putting themselves on my Frapper map, now let's get on with the show. Parks Canada Update. Well, if you're a regular viewer of the show, you know that one of my pet topics is geocaching in Canada's national parks. And as I've mentioned before, they recently introduced a ban on geocaching in the parks and have since come out with a draft policy on geocaching. Now, I've taken a quick look at the policy and it's actually looking very good for us. They will be allowing the sport in the future. It's just there will be some controls on it. And the draft policy is available from the Parks Canada website. And again, I'll have a link to it on my website. And download it, rate it over, and in this article I'm just going to go over th a few of the highlights. So the policy starts off with the general definition on geocaching, and then from there they actually get into the definition of caches. Now these are Parks Canada modified definitions, and there's a few differences in them. For example, the definition of a cache. Cache. A Parks Canada approved hidden container that includes a logbook, pencil, pencil sharpener and a cash note with Parks Canada educational content. No trade items are allowed in caches. So that's the big difference between a traditional cache and what's going to be a Parks Canada cache is the trading items. Now whether or not that'll include trackables such as travel bugs or coins, we're not quite sure. They're still working on a draft policy. However, as of now, it looks like we'll still be able to use traditional caches. The policy then goes on to define other caches. For example, virtual caches will be making a return in Canada's national parks, and they're defined as a virtual cache means there's no physical container. The location or destination of the cache is the cache itself. Example, a landmark, a spectacular feature or view, an interpretive sign or a historical plaque, etc. This category includes earth caches. Now that pretty much stays the same. Now for those of us who have been playing the game for a while, know that geocaching has not been approving many virtual caches lately. However, with the new stand with Parks Canada, looks like we just might be able to get some virtuals listed again. And myself, when they were still around, I truly did enjoy the virtuals. It was just nice just to go to a spot, just to see the spot, as opposed to going somewhere and you know, looking for a tiny little bison tube or a, or you know any kind of cash container whatsoever. It's just nice just to go 
and see something and just be somewhere. And I've always been a fan of virtual caches and I'm looking forward to their re eventual return. Cache placement guidelines they go on to write. Placing a cache in Parks Canada site requires extra care due to the significance of the location. Parks Canada staff will determine the appropriateness of a cache location by considering the guidelines below. And they go on a list of series of guidelines and again it's nothing too crazy. They're mostly thinking about environmental impact and how far off the trail it is. Um, again myself, one of my favorite places to go is Jasper National Park which is just a four hour drive east of here. And one of my highlights is Athabasca Falls. Absolutely, totally insane waterfall. The problem with Athabasca Falls is that so many people have gone there over the ages that they've basically walked wherever they've wanted to and to get a closer look to the falls and get closer to the river. And you can actually see the erosion where plants and soil has been trampled by thousands, if not millions of feet, and nothing can grow there anymore. And so a few years back, they've actually went in and put in concrete trails, a concrete sidewalk and guardrails, so they're very limited to where you can walk. But still, years later, you can go along and see where the old foot trails were, and chances are nothing may ever grow there again, which is rather unfortunate. And again, this is one of the things that Parks Canada is just taking a look at and making sure that things just don't go too crazy with some of the cache placements. The geocaching draft also includes a definition of a containers, and it reads, Cache containers and contents must adhere to all applicable conditions to ensure no damage to the environment, wildlife, historical, or cultural resources. No trade items are allowed within the caches. This is to support Parks Canada Leave No Trace philosophy and ensure that caches do not contain items that might attract wildlife. Again, they're just looking out for nature and all things involved, and it goes on and has a definition of some of the cache containers. And again, most of it's fairly common sense. The big one, no food containers. Animals, if you don't know, can really smell well. And I've seen old food containers that have been through a dishwasher that animals have still managed to find and dig up and destroy. So it looks like most of the cache containers, according to Parks Canada specs, will actually have to be some form of metal, not so much ammo boxes because they're going to be big and bulky, but you'll probably start seeing a lot more of the old Altoids uh, 10 microtype caches. So the draft policy also includes a section on placing a cache, and they come up with four steps to properly place a cache in a national park. And the four steps are investigate, get approval, place the cache once Parks Canada grants approval, and post the cache on the listing service. So it's basically similar to what we do now with the additional step of getting approval. And what it involves is actually taking the cache to Parks Canada, have them have a look at it, make sure that the contents are what are allowed, and letting them know where it's going to be. And again, when you download the document, it gets into more details in there. The draft policy then goes on to explain compliance and maintenance and other simple factors involved in maintaining the cache. For example, keep an eye on it. Uh, Parks Canada staff will be checking on caches to see how they're doing and if something's wrong with the cache or they suddenly figure it's inappropriate, they will be confiscating the cache. The final page of the draft is the Parks Canada version of the geocaching letter. We're all familiar with the letter. Congratulations, you found this box intentionally or not. And it's very similar to the geocaching.com letter. It's just a few extra lines in there explaining the Parks Canada policies. And again, it's included with the document that you can download from Parks Canada. And again, I'll have a link to it on my website. So that's essentially what's happening right now. Um, there was a process where they were taking feedback from us. Unfortunately, by the time the show airs, that uh, period will be over. I mentioned that in my previous Microzine edition. And it really starting to look good for us. Uh, Parks Canada is... Uh, you know, fairly convinced and as I mentioned earlier I was actually speaking with a geologist from Parks Canada and they're actually quite excited about the sport. It's just another form of recreation, another way to bring more people to the park and uh, enjoy Canada's natural beauty. Now one thing I'd actually like to hear from you guys, my geocaching audience, is I get letters quite often people explaining how difficult it is to place caches in various areas. So if you have any stories or if you have links to various policies in your part of the planet send them to me. I'd really like to get some kind of compilation going. I might put it on the web or mention it in future episodes on just how difficult it is to place caches in different different parts of the world. I'm hearing everything from 
places now where you, if you place a cache within an urban environment, not only have to get the coordinates, you also have to give a picture to the local police because so many people are calling in ammo boxes as bomb threats. So, if you know, if you have a specific policy or if you have a parks policy, or let me know what you have to go through in your part of the world to place a cache, and I'll throw something all together, and we'll have it on an upcoming episode of Ice and Rice Geocaching Video Scene. So back in June on my Okanagan vacation, I visited Vernon, British Columbia and found a series of caches that are based on a series of murals in the downtown core. A few years ago, the downtown group got together and decided to beautify the area by having these historical murals painted on the sides of buildings. And they're absolutely gorgeous. I really enjoyed the tour. And a while back, someone decided, hey, what a great idea for a series of multi-caches. And if you find all the caches in the series, you'll actually get a chance to see all 27 murals. Information on the murals can be found on the web. I'll have links on, my, on the show notes. And also at north and south end of Vernon, there are tourist information booths, and they also have handouts. They'll give you stories and the whole, the whole idea behind the entire mural series. But anyways, let's just roll the film. Mural series, Vernon, British Columbia, beautiful urban caching. Welcome to Vernon. It rocks. Ah, actually, the name of a cache here on the uh, south end of Vernon at the tourist information booth. And uh, so while I'm down here on vacation in the Okanagan, of course, I have to do some caching. And uh, so I did a pop query on the Okanagan area through everything to my computer and brought it up on the screen to see where it's basically it was a high density area. And the city of Vernon is crazy. It's, uh, it's actually quite a few caches around here. And uh, I've been here before. You might remember from episode 3787 Vernon by Chris S. It was, uh, it was a really cool cache. And uh, so anyways, I'm back here in Vernon to do a series of other caches, including the one that's uh, pretty much almost right behind me called Welcome to Vernon It Rocks. It's right here at the tourist information booth. And strangely enough, at the north end of the town, going towards Kamloops, there's another uh, Ver uh, Welcome to Vernon type uh, tourist information booth cache. It's actually quite dense around here. Uh, what I'm mostly going to feature in this uh, brief article are a series of uh, puzzle caches. Sorry, not puzzle caches. Um, themed caches. There's um, one that's all in downtown Vernon. It's all urban and it can actually, the whole series can pretty much be done on foot. And it features a series of murals in downtown Vernon. A few years ago they decided to uh, beautify downtown Vernon so they went out and they got historical pictures and they actually had artists paint the uh, sides of buildings with these absolutely incredible murals. Now if you go to the tourist information booth on the other end of town, you can actually get a little flyer and it has stories behind all the different murals and sort of a mapping area of where they all are. But uh, fortunately a uh, Vernon area geocacher named Groundhog has uh, placed uh, caches at uh, a few of these uh, a few of these murals and a lot of them are actually uh, multi caches. There's 27 murals all together. And he's actually set it up so if you do all his entire series of uh, caches, you actually get a chance to see all 27 murals. And um, looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's like it's going to be quite a bit of fun. So it's downtown Vernon, which is a little ways from where I am now, but we're uh, going to pack everything head up and uh, head on down, and we'll see you guys at the first mural. So our first mural is called the City of Vernon, and it features a pair of gentlemen who were considered to be the Wright Brothers of Vernon. And they actually built the first plane ever in Vernon, and that's basically what's depicted behind me on the wall. And this is actually one of the uh, stages in one of the multi-caches, and nearby there's a very small micro that gives you coordinates to, uh, actually this one gives you coordinates to the third and final stage, which is located fairly close by. But anyway, since the first mural, there's more to go, and I'm not going to get to all of them, but uh, I'll show you some good highlights. We're off and running. This day is not gone away The sun will eventually set And my good mood will be broken again But what you gonna do when your summer comes to this? Besides have a little fun, nothing can touch that place Behind me is another one of these great murals in downtown Vernon. This particular mural features a woman named Catherine Schubert. 
Catherine was the first white woman to travel overland from eastern Canada to BC in 1862. She was five months pregnant and had her child within hours of uh, reaching her final destination. Now, if you look around the area here, you can see that uh, there's a lot of cars. And this uh, brings up one interesting aspect of this whole uh, mural series, that it's all downtown Vernon and it's all urban. So, there's lots of muggle traffic around, so you really should have to be discreet. And uh, basically, I have to admit, I was actually here yesterday and I uh, did three in the series. And basically, the way it worked out is I spent the afternoon doing the groundwork, finding the clues, getting everything together, and then went off, did some other stuff, came back in the evening, and then went to the final cash locations. And that's what you might have to do because, well, it is a fairly, uh, pretty busy area. But uh, I tell you, there's some absolutely great murals down here. So, uh, we're just going to pack up the uh, camera and uh, continue on with the tour and we'll show you some more murals. So I'm taking a break from visiting the murals to do another Groundhog and Shadow Cash called Vernon's Justice Court Park, appealing and peaceful. And this is a really great little park area. It's got a nice little waterfall and some grassy area. And every time I come here, I've been here a couple of times looking for the cash already, actually. It's uh, always packed with sunbathers. So you have to be a little discreet in your looking. It's a two-stage multi, but fortunately the stages are only about 50 meters apart. So if you're in downtown Vernon and you're doing the mural thing, just uh, head on over to Justice Park and check out this other great little cache. Just a few of the 27 murals located in downtown Vernon. If you'd like to see them all, come on down. You can go to either end of the uh, town to the tourist information booth. We have a nice little pamphlet there that gives you map locations and tells you the stories behind all the various paintings. And of course, while you're here, make sure you check out the mural series by Groundhog and Shadow. Very well done. Of course, you've got to be stealthy, so do it in the evening. You're, it's not quite as busy as it is now here in downtown Vernon, but I did enjoy myself doing the series, and I'm looking forward to doing some more of his caches. So if you're ever in the Vernon area, make sure you check out the Micro Cache Mural Series. It was a lot of fun, and there's some great art to be seen. But anyways, that about wraps it up for this episode of Ice and Rise to you, a caching video scene. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, I don't know. What do you think? I think I can put this hat on eBay and get some money for it. <laughs> so in the meantime, and in between time, that's it. Another episode of Fights and Rise Geocaching Video Zine. So until then, cash on. That's what the inside of a camera looks like. Come with you see my dog. 
So just near the edge of Vernon's downtown core is another cache by Groundhog and Shadow called Vernon's Justice Court Park. 